thanks for each and every one that's uh, here, Lord. Have more come in, Lord, and that's a blessing, Lord, to hear the preaching of thy word and, and the scripture reading, Lord God. And Father, uh, we do pray, I do pray for each and every one, Lord God, that uh, that you'll help them, Lord, that the, the message, uh, that the Sunday school message and the message they're about to hear, Lord God, uh, I help them and strengthen them here in these uh, these wicked days that we're in right now, Lord God. And Father, uh, they encourage them, Lord, to uh, uh, stay in the faith, uh, stay on their knees and in the Bibles, Lord God. And Father, to uh, do the right thing uh, the right way, Lord. And Father, I, I do pray, Lord God, again, for all of the, our ones that uh, have afflictions and illnesses, Lord, that you'll touch them and help them. Also, the ones that we pray for all the time, Lord, Father, help them, help their families. And we'll give you all the praise, honor, and the glory. We thank you and praise you, Lord. Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, good morning. Good morning, Peter. Good morning. So what's wrong with the worst half? <laughs> uh, let's see. It's a... Uh, um, You're on video. Uh, can't manage to get himself out of bed. <laughs> all right. Well, he's all right, though. He's okay. Hey, man. Well, at least you made it. He's a couple of days. He was going back Tuesday morning. So he'll be back on the road. I cleaned the whole truck out. Everything is spick and span. So <laughs> all the laundry is done. So. But you're not going with him this time? Oh, no, please. Are you kidding me? Almost four weeks with him <laughs> in that truck? I love him to death. You know I love my husband. Yeah. But that was just a little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a, you know. No, it wasn't we, quite we, that much. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Where do we have to go? Do you want something to eat again? <laughs> Honey, it's only been like 12 hours. <laughs> she was the navigator. Pee? You have to pee? <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. He didn't give you a five-gallon bucket in the sleeper? Uh, Man, with a lid on it? No, I don't even go there, but it was about an eight-ounce cup. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> when you're trying to make the schedule in there. Yeah, well, that's the hard thing, you know? I mean, sometimes you got a day in between, and sometimes you have three hours. Yeah. So it's, you know, I mean, it's tough. And believe me, I just, I got the taste of what he goes through every day. And I wouldn't want to do it. Four wheelers out there cutting you off, oh pulling in front God. of you, stepping on the brakes. Not four wheelers cutting you off. I mean, Eighteen wheelers bad are bad now. The sandal wearing, short wearing, do oh so breed truckers. Sand, yeah. Yeah. The with the towel heads. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, it's the little rag tops. <laughs> it, it, it's the little VWs thinking that they can cut in front of an eighteen wheeler loaded. And we can step on the brakes and, oh, yeah, I'll just stop right now. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm going to make a license plate out of you. All right. Let's turn to <laughs> page 126, Rock of Ages. Let's stand and sing. <laughs> 126, Rock of Ages. All right. We need someone born in the blood or a trail of blood. Well, like we were talking about earlier, Brother Dave and I, that, you know, Dale using a dictionary now and going through the definitions are a big help for him. Amen. Not so much for us. No, it's a big help for him. Amen. And uh, that, that works out pretty good because you get an idea and then you know where to go with it. Amen. So that's pretty good. All right, you ready? Intro.
my tears forever flow. Let my sin no longer go. For sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. In my hand the price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. I'm the last while I draw the fleeting breath. With my eyes shall close in death. When I rise to worlds unknown, and behold the on my throne. If I had a voice, I could. You're bad. All right. When are you all going to start singing again? You know, it, it's nice if we could have that. I mean, you know, and put your heart into the church and your voice. Act like you love God. Even if you don't obey him. Amen. God didn't give you a talent to waste. Then we got to put people up here with no talent to make a disgrace. <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, after services or before? All right. Let's do it after. So after services, we'll be anointing Sister Teresa. Amen. As the next pastor of this. I mean, uh, <laughs> for an illness she's suffering they've been and uh <laughs> all right you girls have a song yes well come and sing it The Lord, the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testament of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than Genesis in chapter 6. 
Genesis in chapter 6. I was given this book to look at 51 reasons why the King James, the path from doubt to faith. And uh, even one that is basically supporting the King James, you have to be careful of. Because some of these people put their own theology in there and they could mess it up. And so I was reading uh, in here and he talks about cherubims and seraphims and, and all that. But he says modern translations missed the point of the Nephilim. That's supposed to be the Hebrew word or whatever for giants. Amen. And so I wanted to start in the King James Bible in chapter 6. Do you realize that the King James Bible was written on a 6th grade education level? Things have changed. But you understand that today if you've had a 6th grade education in our day, You'd probably be a four-year college student today. <laughs> Amen. You might even have a doctorate. <laughs> but uh, as I said this morning, this world's a mess. Uh, we've dumbed down generation after generation. We've allowed the communistic, socialistic, Idiots in there into the infiltrate the schools and the churches. Amen. And they come up with all these other versions and and uh, it's designed to dumb people down. The Bible says if the gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? Lost. Lost. Amen. Now, this is just plain old simple English. Not hard to understand. But. I want to look in chapter 6, verse 1 of Genesis. And it came to pass when men begin to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Now, who were these sons of God? You know, Adam was called the son of God. When you read the genealogy and you go back, Adam was called the son of God. Now, this fellow here, he gets into this pretty deep. I'm going to read to you what he said. A lot of people are getting very distracted with teaching about angels mating with humans and making superhumans of half angels. In fact, some Bible translations have left the untranslated word Nephilim, so we have to trust the experts to tell us what it means. Is it possible that God isn't the author of this distraction? Is it possible that the devil has something to do with this? Perhaps the devil is trying to distract us from listening to something important that God is saying to us. If so, what truth is Satan trying to distract us from? We can find out by answering a few simple questions. The Bible speaks of God the Father and his only begotten Son. Now we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is his only begotten Son, but we are also called sons of God also. But the Bible also says that there are those called the sons of God. So who are the sons of God in Genesis 6? We want to know what God said. So let me show you in Genesis 6, verses 1, 2, 4, and 5, KJV. 
And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and took them wives of which they chose. Now, so there are men on earth, and those men had daughters. The sons of God saw those daughters of men who were fair, and they took wives of all daughters of men that they chose. There were giants on the earth in those days, and there were also giants on the earth after those days, at the time that the sons of God made babies with the daughters of men. He, what he's saying is that these sons of God were just men that were marrying women. Now, it says there were giants in the land in those days and, and before those days and after. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they, the what we call the sons of God, were raising uh, giants, but it says they were raising men of renown. Amen. And uh, he goes on to say, uh, he says, walk through this with me slowly. Who or what will you trust to tell you the answer? If you already believe that angels made it with humans, surprise. There are some version paraphrases made just for you. They literally wrote in the text. All right. And he gives you uh, a bunch of illustrations from different versions, the message Bible and, and all this. And then he said, so this is the message of Eugene Peterson, 2002. The men are the human race. The daughters of those men are daughters of the human race. The sons of God don't seem to be the human race, but it doesn't say. The Nephilim are giants like in the King James. The giants are those babies that sons of God had with daughters of the human race. And after this in verse 5, it says God saw the hum that human evil was out of control. That's from uh, Peterson. Uh, here's where he goes to prove his point. Can angels make baby angels? What verse in the Bible says angels can make baby angels? <laughs> the paraphrasing, and by the way, angels are not women. Amen. You see these little women with wings, they're not angels. Amen. Angels were men. Amen. And they didn't have wings. And they didn't have wings. He said there are three groups, believers, heathen, and pagans. Believers believe and follow God. Heathen don't follow God. Pagans follow other gods. So if they didn't get the story from the Bible, did it come from the heathen or pagans? Why would they trust heathen or pagan writings to interpret the Bible? Two, do angels have men's private body parts? <clears throat> For angels to make baby angels, they have to have those parts. For angels to make baby humans with women, they have to have those parts. Not only that, but angels would have to make baby angels the same way humans make baby humans. Angels would have to have physically compatible DNA. I don't know where he gets that information from, but he says, what clear Bible verses state that angels have men's parts. Well, it does. And if it's not in the Bible, where'd they get it from? Why do they trust the book more than the Bible? Then he says, and wait, I thought angels were spirits, like in Psalm 104, verse 4, and Hebrews 1, 7, and Hebrews 1, 14 says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Jesus made the angels, so he should know that what's true. He himself said in Luke 24, 39, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And what he's doing is twisting up context of scripture. Amen. Angels, which are spirits, don't have flesh and bones. Right? That's what he says. Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 18. In verse 1, and the Lord appeared unto him, Abraham, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in a tent door in, in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and bowed himself toward the ground, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away. 
I pray thee from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts after that ye shall pass on. For therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, so do. As thou hast said, and Abraham hasted into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed, and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, Am I waxed old? Shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham, now one of these men is who? Amazing. The Lord. It's the pre-incarnate Christ Amen. working on behalf of Israel. Amen. And he's an angelic being in this particular instance. That's the angel of the Lord, the one that went out and slew a few thousand people. Amen. The one that passed through Egypt. The night of the Passover. Amen. So does he have a body? Yeah. Uh, evidently, he must have flesh and bones. Uh, he did eat just like any other person. They set food before him. Well, who were the other two with him? Angels. They were on their way to Sodom to destroy him for their wickedness of sodomy. Amen. Men with men, women with women. God's on his way to destroy his cities. And he says, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now. And see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which has come, come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Now, these men are going in to try to pull Lot out and destroy this place. Now, he said a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. How did he grab Lot and drag him in the door when the men of Sodom tried to take him. And then they wanted him to send out the men that were in there. It meant that they may know him. How would they want to know him? Like, uh, hi, I'm one of the angels of the Lord. <laughs> no. They wanted to know them. In a physical way. All right, so I'm going to cut off there, go to the next chapter, verse 1. And there came to two, and there came two angels to Sodom at Eden. Now these men look like men. In Hebrews it says, be careful to entertain strangers, for some have entertained angels 
unawares. He said, are they all not ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them that shall be heirs of salvation? Does grace have a spirit? Does Steve have a spirit? Amen. Do you through your spirit minister unto each other? Don't you cook for him? Doesn't he eat it? And he's still alive? <laughs> Amen. So just when he says spirit doesn't mean that they're just spirits. He said in another place in Matthew, I think it's chapter 22, don't quote me, that uh, they were asking if a man had uh, a wife and she die, and where's it a husband? Help me. Her husband. husband. And Anyway, marries again. Whose wife would she be in the resurrection? And he said, they'd be like the angels of heaven. They neither are given in marriage or, you know, they don't marry. Didn't say they couldn't perform marital things. Amen. So Genesis says that these sons of God took daughters of men as they chose. Now, Again, who are the sons of God? Look over in Job chapter 1. Again, there was a man, verse 1, in the land of Uz. Remember, that's not Oz. This is not Dorothy. This is Job. Amen. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for the three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now, verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. Who came to present themselves before the Lord? The sons of God. So what are they? Angels. Angels. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Now, Satan is not in hell at this time. Amen. Um, matter of fact, this guy says that hell is not even open. It won't be open to Revelation. Not true. Well, where was Jesus when he said the pains of hell got hold upon me? Amen. Where was the Rich man in Luke. Some people say, well, I've studied that and I've read and uh, it means uh, Gehenna or the grave. Well, if it's the grave, it's awful fiery. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Hell is a literal place that is open today and it enlarges itself daily. So my point is to go back to this. 51 reasons why the King James. Now, though the man's trying to defend the King James, he's also destroying it by false theology. You know why? Because there's people, independent Baptists, that do not believe that Jesus went to hell when the Bible plainly says it. They refuse to believe it. Why? Because they think, how could God put his son in hell or how could his son go to hell? Well, is he not called our substitutionary atonement? Where were you going if you die in your sin? So if I'm going to take your place, where do I have to go? 
Makes sense to me. For David can, speaketh concerning him. I saw the Lord uh, always for my for saw, I saw the Lord always before my face. And he said that his soul was not left in hell in Acts chapter two. Neither did thine holy one see corruption. Acts chapter thirteen says the same thing. Psalm sixteen and Psalms one hundred and sixteen. He says the pains of hell got hold upon me. Doesn't sound like a grave, does it? So what happened when Jesus died? He said, Father, into thy hands commend I my spirit. His spirit returned unto the Father. His body was taken to a tomb, and his soul descended into hell. The Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and over all the flock of which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. When did God ever have blood in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. And so it took God's blood to cleanse us and to redeem us. Now, just reading simple scripture, I can understand that these sons of God were angelic beings. And evidently, even though it says, doesn't say that they had human bodily parts, they were able to create or procreate, whatever you want to call it. Amen. The trouble with most people is they look at that. They've got a thought in their mind that that can't be. This should be that. And they take a verse and they take it out of context. No, they don't marry in heaven. They're sons of God. Look over in the book of Jude. 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 J-U-D-E. Dude. That's what we should have preached on today. The Gadarian. A new dude in a rude mood. Maybe you looked at me and thought that. <laughs> no, if I saw you as a new dude, I'd be preaching on the abomination of desolation. <laughs> uh, Jude verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And look at verse 6. And the angels which what? Kept not, their first Kept not their first estate. But left their own habitation. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities round about them in like manner. Giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Amen. Notice right after verse 6 is verse 7. They left their habitation. They cohabited with the human race. And men of renown were born. Now the Bible doesn't have the word demon in it because there are no demons. But it does have the word devil and devils. Amen. Now, what are fallen angels? Devils. devils. Amen. The ones that when Lucifer decided to overthrow God or try to, they followed him. Now, these devils need to embody somebody. 
just like they did in the swine and other things. But today, in this day and age, they're embodying human beings. I've never seen such craziness. Every day you read about another mass shooting. Amen. The Democrats could be behind that. Amen. Trying to get your guns taken away from you. Yeah. I'm not saying they are. I'm saying they could be. Uh, they're pushing all that. When in life have you ever seen people so disrespectful to authority? Every day you read about somebody shooting at a cop, trying to kill a cop, trying to run over a cop. I'm talking about all across the country. These people are devil possessed. You know how they got that way? The Bible says to beat your children with a rod. Amen. Thou shalt deliver their soul from hell. Amen. The Bible says that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from them. Now, I've heard mothers stupidly say that I'm not beating my children. Now, I didn't say abuse them. Amen. God gave some meaty parts, amen, <laughs> wherefore to work upon in the event that you have to use a rod. Amen. But I've heard women say this, stupid comments like this, I love my children too much to whip them. You ever heard that? Think about this. If you love them, if you say you love them and you don't beat them, the Bible says you're a liar. Why? Because you're trying to correct them and show them that there are consequences for disobedience and rebellion. Amen. So you look at this generation we got now. You know what that generation is? That's a generation of parents that have not whipped their children. What is it? Spare the rod? Of Spoil the child, yeah. But so now we've got these little children that had no discipline, didn't know how to behave. Now they're adults. But it's not so cute anymore, is it? Then you got social services saying, you can't do this and you can't do that. They're going to tell you how to raise your kids, but if they do something wrong, they want to hold you responsible. There was a couple that was on vacation while they were gone. The neighbor kids went into their house and destroyed it. Destroyed it. And the law said they can't do nothing because they're underage. Whatever happened for the parents being responsible? Where are the parents at? You see, today, people just let their kids run wild. You know how my kids behave when I went into somebody's house? You sit right there and you behave. But let me show you how rebellious children are. Maybe you've been through it. You've got some children. You ever tell them, I said, sit right here and be still. What do they do? They sit over here. You know what they just did? They said, I'm going to sit down, but not where you tell me. I caught on to that when my kids were little. I remember little Jonathan Knowles. He was a blessing to me. Three years old. Sitting at the dinner table, I'd bring him home from church with me, and and uh, we'd watch him. And I say, "Now, eat." Eh. I said, "I said, eat." Eh. I said, went over, picked him up, carried him into the living room, laid him across my knee. Now eat. Take him back out there. Eh. I did that twice, and then I figured out he is padded. <laughs> he has a pamper on. I picked him up, took him in, pulled his pamper down a little bit, caught him right on his cheeky olus. Bah! Bah! I said, now eat. <laughs> these kids are smarter than the parents these days. But look what you're raising when they grow up. Do you want them out there shooting cops, going to jail, getting shot themselves? If you love your children, you make them obey. Why? Because you love them and you're worried about their future. Amen. Now, you know what Israel, what they did in Israel when a, when a 
parent had a rebellious child that even after they got done chasing and everything, they would not obey. You remember what they did, Brother Dave? Yes, they stoned him. They called for the elders of the city and they took him out and they stoned him publicly so that there wouldn't be rebellion in Israel. And mom and dad threw the first stones. Could you imagine that if you live back in the Old Testament? I couldn't do that. I'd mod to sometimes, but I couldn't. <laughs> Listen. And then we have people that profess to be Christians writing books and telling you to set little Johnny in the corner and put a dunce hat on. <laughs> you ever have to do that when you were in school? Anybody my age had to do that? We would stand. I sat in a lot of corners. <laughs> I wore, I wore a lot of dunce hats. But you know what? It didn't help. The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. It's bound in there. And he said the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. The rod of correction. A instrument of authority but sitting in the corner never helped me but buddy when dad come home <laughs> that's a different story where mom now my mom was tough she'd be in jail today if she was alive <laughs> amen my mom would grab a shoe a stick a coat hanger i mean you name it Anything that was available. Her fist. I busted all the windows out of a man's bar, barn next door. The man come over and knocked on the door. I'm standing there beside my mom. I'm a little guy. <laughs> Not that little. I still had a newspaper wrap. But anyway, my mom opens the door and the man's standing there. He said, Ma'am, I, I hate to bother you, but your son broke all the windows out of my barn. Liar! Bow! <laughs> I'm laying on the floor with blood running out my mouth. <laughs> and the man says, ma'am, I didn't mean for you to do that. He said, he don't talk to his elders that way. Ooh. My mom didn't care who you called. I took a boy in. I had two, three here. I had Derek. I had, uh, oh, goodness. What was the other two names? Jason. Jason and. I don't remember the other names. <laughs> I brought two now. Uh, anyway. We were up there in the room there one day, and I was getting on him about something, and he had been sneaking out. And, and uh, he was in his 30s, just a young guy. Anyway, he, uh, I come in and I forget what he did. And uh, anyway, he grabbed my coat and tried to pull it over me to tie my arms up. And I just slipped out of it, grabbed him by the throat and said, I'm going to give you the first one. After that, I'm going to drive you through that window. <laughs> They'd have been upset about that. But Jason... Now, Jason was another one. His dad wanted me to try to straighten him out. So they moved to Florida. <laughs> Left me with Jason. Jason runs away. I don't know why anybody would want to run away from a place like this with me trying to help him. <laughs> but they ran away, Richard. <laughs> he gets down to Florida. Parents find out and they drag him back up there. Well, he gets tied up with a radio station down there and hooked up with some queer. And he tells them that there's this pastor in South Carolina that is abusing children. <laughs> Next thing you know, I got him back. I get a call from DSS, Devils and Satan Service. <laughs> and they want to know if I'm so-and-so and if I have so-and-so. I said, yeah. They said, well, you need to come in here. I said, maybe I will, maybe I won't. 
what do you want? Well, you just need to come in here. So I come home, tell my wife about it. And I take Jason and I head on over there. And I get over there and they start asking me questions. I said, no, you talk to me. You don't ask him anything. Is your name so-and-so? I said, well, you seem to have all the information. You tell me. <laughs> and they started asking me other questions. And I said, I'm not answering you. Oh, no, I know what it was. I got there, and they were making me wait. And I said, you tell them they got five minutes. If they ain't here in five minutes, I'm out of here. <laughs> here they come. Start the question. You got the information. You tell me all about it. You seem to know. They said, well, this person is accused. I said, you're talking about the faggots in Florida? <gasps> you mean homosexual. No, I mean sodomite. I said, now, what do you want? They said, you're abused. I said, put your shirt up, Jason. I said, he look abused? I said, I beat his hide when I have to. I said, we're out of here. So I left. A few days later, they show up with a sheriff deputy out here. Deputy says, how you doing? I said, fine, till you showed up. What do you want? Well, DSS is on their way over, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, when they get here, tell them to leave. I walk down to the trailer there, tell my wife, I'm going to get a haircut. You can't do that. I said, they can't serve something fine here. <laughs> right, Rich? You got it. <laughs> so my wife says, no, no. Well, about that time, here they are. So we go up here and they're saying, are you so-and-so? This is, I said, let me see that thing. I snatched it out of the deputy's hand. I looked at it. I said, tell him get off my property. That ain't me. The DSS says, you're not Pastor Townsend? I said, I am Pastor Townsend, not Pastor Tosin. Can we see your license? I said, yes, sir. They said, he's right. I said, now get off my property. So they kept on talking to each other. I said, I said, get off my property and get off it now or I'll call the state police. They said, you won't give it, show us a courtesy? I said, I'm not giving you any kind of courtesy. Get off the property. So DSS leaves and I'm talking to the deputy. I said, now, sir, you can go in. And you can look at anything you want. I said, I've got nothing to hide. I ask, I'll answer any question you got. But I am not helping them bunch of devils. He said, I can see that. <laughs> he said, I don't need to see it. So the next time with little Jason, he takes off again one night. He catches a ride with a state trooper over to 44 truck stop. Some truck driver's going to take him to Florida, so he takes him home because he's not leaving yet for Florida, and he goes through his stuff, and he finds his Bible with my name and number on it, and he calls me. Pastor Towns, I said, yeah. I said, I got this guy. I said, yeah, he's running away again. I said, his dad and them live in Florida, and they've been asking me to keep him. He says, well, we're at this address. I drive over there. They let me in. He's laying on the floor in his bedroom. Wired up, rock music blaring in his ears. I walked in, I said, Pastor Townsend. I said, I'm your worst nightmare, boy. Get up. <laughs> I bring him back. A week or so later, he runs away again. This time, my wife's with me. We're in the van. We pull up here where the old store was. He's out there with the ferret my brother gave him and his suitcase and stuff. So this is rubbing off on Derek by now. He had that little animal. Yeah, he had that little ferret hanging off him. And there was a Lexington County Sheriff Deputy there. So I pulled in. I said, put your stuff in the van. Deputy says, wait a minute. He says, uh, you're abusing him. I went over to the payphone then. They had payphones. I dialed his dad's number. I said, here. He talked to his dad for a minute. Come back. 
He says, well, I checked him. I didn't see nothing. I said, we put him in the Marine Corps if he wouldn't run away from that. Well, that was the right thing to say because his deputy was a former Marine also. Oh. The boy said something. He said, boy, you're about to get on the 3rd Marine Division side of me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the God says to him, he says, boy, you can either go with him or go to jail. He says, I'll go to jail. <laughs> the cop looks at me and says, I tried to bluff him, but it ain't working. <laughs> I said, I'll tell you what. I said, started raining. I said, you go on inside the store there a minute. And I said, I'll be taken care of in just a moment. He goes in the store. I walk up to the boy. I said, let me tell you something, boy. I said, that cop ain't going to be here all night. And I said, when he leaves, it's going to be bad for you. <laughs> I said, now put your junk in the van. He goes over, puts his stuff in the van. The deputy walks out. I said, he's going with me, sir. <laughs> I bring him back here. I threw him up the steps. I wrote on there, I give Pastor Townsend permission to beat my butt. I said, sign it. He said, I said, sign it. He goes, <coughs> toward butter. <laughs> Finally, down the road, he goes back with his parents. Do you know that young man came by here and thanked me? When he got older. He's on Facebook sometimes. He's on Facebook sometimes. Bald is a yeah. jelly bean. So I mean, <laughs> be no party over there. I understand. <laughs> he's got a family. I think he's doing well now. But Derek, he, Derek, he kind of rubbed off on Derek. So... I get up one morning and nobody can find Derek. Bed's not made, nothing. So I, I take off down Nazareth. There's Derek. Headed westbound with a garbage bag over his back, headed for Florida. <laughs> school teacher comes up that knew him because I sent him to private school. School teacher comes up. I said, that's right, I got him. I said, throw your junk in the trunk, boy. And I hit the button for that Cadillac we had, and the trunk opened up and threw it in. I said, we got it. He got in. I said, boy, what's wrong with you? You didn't even make your bed. I woke up late. <laughs> <laughs> Derek was pretty slick. But you know what? You could never get that foolishness out of him. He's still a fool today. We'd buy him gallons of milk. He wouldn't drink it. Tea started rotting out. Amen. You know, he could get up here and preach better than most preachers. He knew his Bible. But he had no desire for it. The other one, Paul. Paul was in jail, and I got him out on work release so he could see his family. Then I took him in over here. Paul Womack. I understand he's living in Charlotte now and doing good. He doesn't look like nothing, that skinny little guy he was. Big every sick guy now. <laughs> but you know what? Some people, the word gets in and settles in, and they change. Why? Because they start to obey it. And that's the purpose of us spanking our children for believing the Bible. And when people come along and they try to tear down the authority of the Bible, even though he's trying to lift it up in one sentence, and he's tearing it down in another. I get over here, he says... <clears throat> He said, the King James Bible doesn't let it have your own way. Breaking news. 22 fourths of Americans do not understand fractions. 
And the other 50% don't understand statistics. Christians tell us that 97% of Bibles all say the same thing, but that the King James Bible is the worst. How can this be? What's hiding behind the numbers? People love to criticize using made-up numbers to make them sound scientific. Why? Many people read the King James Bible because it is their one authority. But those who criticize them can't tell you what their authority is. See, who's your authority today? What is your authority? Do you know if you go pick out any old Bible you want, then you become God and you decide what's right and what's wrong. He said, or else they look all smug and say, Jesus Christ is my authority. Really? And where did you learn about Jesus Christ? Uh, the Bible. <laughs> and we're back to square one. They're stuck because they can't tell you which Bible gives you the ultimate authority about who Jesus Christ is. Or else they, they're like my professors who would say, all of the Bibles tell the truth. But when you back them into a corner, they'll tell you, but the King James Bible is still the worst. Do you know why critics hate it so much? Because it isn't a Burger King Bible. You can't just have it your way. Watch. If you read the King James Bible and you tell them, I read and use the King James Bible, I just don't believe it's my final authority. Authority, they'll give you an A minus. They don't mind if you read it or even believe it as long as it isn't your only and ultimate authority. Don't cut in on their Burger King Bible of the year or month or week. But how could one Bible possibly be so bad 400 years of Christians based their faith on it? 400 years. Greatest revivals America ever saw Amen. on the King James Bible. And many of them have a really good track record. And they believe the words of the King James Bible. <gasps> Gasp. Without knowing Hebrew, Greek, Latin, German, or even Aramaic. So to you guys who say the King James Bible is so bad, I already know most of you haven't actually even read the King James. Someone or a teacher or professor just told you this line and you believed it. So are you willing to read it out loud? He says, come on, take the challenge, the 30-day challenge. Read it out loud for 30 days. But it's too hard. Did you hear that? But it's too hard. <laughs> he said, I'll let you in on a secret. Babies aren't born knowing how to read. They have to listen and learn. I know of five-year-old kids, including my kids and friends, who were reading the King James Bible at that age. Five-year-olds. I think you're smarter than a five-year-old. But if you're still worried, download an audio book, even for your phone. You can have Alexander Scorby in your ears for less than $20. He'll read it to you. Now, he says this. Try it. Read it out loud or have it read to you out loud for 30 days. And then tell me how hard it is to read. Try that for 30 days. He said, one of my friends actually took a 1611 edition with the Roman type and read it aloud for 30 days. And then she came back and she said to me, I can understand the King James. And her faith was lifted because she read a faith-filled version of a faith-filled Bible, not a Doubting Thomas version. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. What have you got to lose? Come on, I dare you. Take the 30-day challenge. And hey, if after 30 days of hearing or reading God's holy and preserved words in English, the King James Bible, you decide to go back to your Burger King Bible, you know what they say. Have it your way. This book here, if you just read it in context, don't try to inject your thoughts into it or your theology or somebody else's theology. You read it. Follow the words. Sons of God. Amen. How about when the 
Sons of God sang in the morning stars. It'll tell you who they are. Amen. All you have to do is believe it. Read it. You know what my attitude was when I got saved? There's a lot I didn't understand in this book. But you know what I said? Whether I understand or not, I'm going to read it and believe it. And then God began to open my eyes. Because he knew I believed what I was saying. I was faithful to it. He would show me things. We would fellowship. For the word of God, the Bible says, is quick. That means it's alive and powerful. And sharper than a two-edged sword. Piercing even dividing asunder. Body. No. Dividing asunder the joints. And marrow. And as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What he's saying is this book reads your mind. This book can tell all about you. And that's why people don't like this book. Because if they read this book. It's going to point them out. Of their sin. And then you have to make a choice. Either I'm going to obey God or I'm going to live in my sin. Hey, I got a choice. You know why people don't come to church? They don't want to hear about their sin. I realized the other day that you can be a young fool or an old fool. And what's sad is when you find old men that are still crackheads. They haven't learned. And they're going to die in their sin and go to a hell. That they probably don't even believe in. And no matter how much you love them or try. They're going to stay that way because that's what they like. Listen, we loved our sister-in-law, Freddie's second wife. But she was a drunk. She even made a profession. She was so bad that if she didn't have money, she'd go down here to the grocery store and shoplift cough syrups. I was the one that had to go tell my brother that she was dead. And that the coroner is going to meet us at the house to carry our body out. It drug her down so low. The reason people hate this Bible is it's going to point out your sin and tell you that there's a cure and you have a choice to make. Amen. But if you have just plain religion, you can go sit in church and usually feel pretty good. They won't say nothing about your sin. That's a sorry preacher to do that. Because he's in it for the money. Greedy of filthy lucre. He's there for a paycheck. So you can go on and live your life any way you want. But there are consequences. Whether your parents ever taught you that or not, there are consequences. Be careful when you pick up books here that's Somebody wanted to know the name of it. It's called 51 Reasons Why the King James, A Path from Doubt to Faith by David W. Daniels. Now he's doing his best to uplift the King James Bible, but at the same time, he's tearing down the authority of it. For the most part, it's pretty good. But even when you get one of these books and you read it, you've got to watch for what the devil will slip in there. That's some chick ministries. Huh? These some chick ministries. Chick ministries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did a lot of slipping in and out. you got to watch chick. He did. I remember when they had the Avengers. Johnny Todd was a former Green Beret. He was one of the Avengers. 
he should be out by now, but he got 30 years over here for rape. While he was in there, he married some other woman so he could have those, uh, what do you call them? Yeah, visits. Then he joined Wicca and became a leader in Wicca. This guy was one of the Avengers, the Crusaders for Chick Publications. Now, a lot of stuff is good, but you got to watch some of this stuff. You see, the devil, he don't care. He would rather get in on a Bible-believing Christian and mess him up than he would just the average lost person out there. He's always tried to make a liar out of God. Believe your Bible. It's not hard to read. You just have to have some discipline. Second epistle of John chapter 1 verse 1 says, The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. What's hard to read that? Or read about that? It's just plain, simple English. What's hard about it? Colossians 1.14, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. What's hard to understand about that? We have redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ and forgiveness of sins. That's not hard to understand. Like I told you before, and I was in, in England. Oh, it makes it easier to understand. It does. I've got two morning stars, one in Isaiah and one in Revelation. One's a devil. The other is Jesus Christ. But they're calling them the same. Well, how do you know? Well, in the originals, you don't have an original. If you had the original, you couldn't read it. But the common person out here that has a Bible, how would they know what's what? They would. The Bible says that we're to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed to be not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth liberally and upbraideth not. God wants you to have wisdom. He wants you to have knowledge. He wants you to understand this because this is his love letter to you. Amen. This is him telling you what your future will be. What your past was. How we got into this mess. The devil's out to destroy you. Amen. Amen. I asked uh, Teresa, was it Wednesday night or Thursday night? The first time you did crack. Thursday. Thursday night with the young people. What did it feel like? She said it was a great rush. And then she said every time she went after it after that was trying to get that first feeling back, but you never get it. Right. Hey, there was I, I never did crack. I did other things, but I didn't do crack. But you realize we got former drug addicts in here. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Might still have some. <laughs> Why can't they quit? Why won't they quit? Oh, when they legalize marijuana. Well, that's going to make it right with God. Alter your mind. You look at her like she's on it. Uh-oh. Hit a home run somewhere. God knows. God knows. Well, because they legalized abortion, you're going to have one? It's legal, you know. 
You gonna kill a baby? It's legal. Well, it's just a weed. It, it helps you. That's just an excuse to keep your sin. But there are consequences. Wait till they diagnose you with lung cancer and the tar is so thick in your lungs. You'd be like the woman that was smoking cigarettes and said, I don't know, she's 50 some years old, led her to the Lord two weeks before she died, preached her funeral. Why did I ever do this? It'd be too late. And then you're going to worry about somebody being on crack. You can't get off marijuana. You're still a stinking drug addict. You're grinning, Dave. You on it? <laughs> you make comparisons like that. You know, alcohol, same way. Yeah. yeah. Alcoholic, drunkards. Any addiction is an addiction. Mm -hmm. I don't care what it is. Cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Food. 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 Yeah. <laughs> but see, the Bible says, be not drunk with wine wearing excess. He didn't say, be not high on weed wearing this excess. <laughs> or eating too many beef steaks or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Everybody's going to have to give an account to God. My job's to preach. You can do what you want with it. Make your excuses, whatever you want. Help yourself. But you love Jesus, don't you? Don't you love Jesus? Yeah, you love Jesus. No, you love yourself. How are you going to win your drug dealer? Let me tell you what Jesus did <laughs> for me. <laughs> huh? Yeah, you're going to win them. How about when your kids look out the window and see you out there? <laughs> I better not catch you with a cigarette. I'll beat you out to death. Well, I guess I better quit meddling. Seems like uh, the Lord dropped a hook somewhere. A wine and Amen. You know, no matter how much I love people, no matter how much I pray for them, until they're willing to turn, God can't help them. Amen. Amen. I told you before when my dad, I prayed for my dad for 12 years. And one day I said, Lord, whatever it takes, I'd rather see him in a nursing home, crippled me having to take care of him the rest of his life on his way to heaven, than running across the United States in his truck with his health on his way to hell. So maybe we ought to start praying that whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to help our friends and loved ones. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll dismiss with prayer and then we'll do the anointing on Sister Teresa. We're going to anoint her with oil according to the scripture. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Amen. So, Brother Steve, if you'll dismiss us. Lord, up was said, Lord, and pray, Lord, we take it to heart. Lord, I pray now that this, uh, 
separate, Lord, that uh, we get our separate places, Lord. That, Lord, through this week, we, Lord, stay on our knees, and Lord, stay in our Bibles, and Lord, uh, just uh, try to wait ourselves through this whole world, Lord God. Lord, I also just pray for all those ones in our church, Lord God, that have uh, physical needs. Lord, you know, each and every one of them, Lord, I pray that you touch them in a special way. Lord, uh, we just pray, pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.